the Air Force Security Assistance and Cooperation Directorate develops and executes international agreements with friendly forces to provide defense materiel and services in support of U.S. national security. The AFSAC Directorate leads the AFMC Foreign Military Sales Enterprise and is charged with administering a more than $225 billion security assistance portfolio, supporting 116 countries and NATO organizations. That's a lot of assistance. I hope you enjoy this next panel on the Advanced Manufacturing Assistance Programs. Good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Sharbaugh. I'm a managing, I'll give you a couple minutes to sit, managing principal at uh, Sable Systems. Sable Systems is a systems integrator and uh, service provider for digital engineering, digital manufacturing, and industry 4.0 uh, solutions. And it's really exciting to introduce this panel. Um, the advanced manufacturing assistance programs actually fill a critical void in our defense uh, manufacturing chain as well as our national manufacturing chain. The cost to entry for a lot of the digital technologies uh, for large companies is hard to swallow. When you get down to the mid-tier and the smaller tiers, it gets actually more and more costly. Our vendors from the IT space are starting to respond. Industry and academia are also starting to respond by introducing open source technologies as well as more advanced approaches to deal with the cybersecurity and operational technology risks. At that point, Fernando and the panel come on board. I have to check to make sure my hearing aids are still in. <laughs> All right. Fernando, you got the call. Thank you, sir. So good morning. My name is Fernando Browning, and I'll be your moderator this morning uh, for the Advanced Manufacturing Assistance Programs panel. Uh, myself, I'm a plans and programs engineer uh, for the Engineering Technology and Technical Policy Division at headquarters. AFMC, Air Force Material Command. Um, so I have a lot of responsibilities with that job, but basically I'm responsible for policy that affects stakeholders across the AFMC. Um, as with anybody involved in policy, it's not an easy job, um, but an important one. And it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, so now I'll introduce the, the panel members. Uh, so we have Mr. Aaron Patrick, who is currently serving as the Interim State Director of the Ohio Manufacturing Extension Partnership, MEP program. He has spent over six years with the MEP program. Uh, he's also a fellow Wright State alum. Go Raiders. Uh, Go, Raiders. Go Raiders. I think I can just stop there. I think that speaks for <laughs> itself. Uh, so, so next we have, at the end there, uh, Dr. Ted, or excuse me. I practiced this 10 times tonight. <laughs> I always said Ned, I said Ted this time. So we have Dr. Ned Hill, who is a, a professor of economic development in the Ohio State University's John Glenn College of Public Affairs and Senior Researcher, Research Associate of the College of Engineering's Ohio Manufacturing Institute. Uh, he teaches public economics, economic development, and state and local public policy. Uh, and I understand that he's keeping his, stu his students well engaged with assignments while he is here on this panel. You are a man with a plan. You got it all figured out. Uh, and last but not least, we have Mr. Mr. Phil Ratterman, who is the director of Fastlane, uh, the, re the regional partner for Ohio MEP, uh, Manufacturing Extension Partnership, covering the Western Ohio region. Fastlane is focused on helping manufacturing companies grow in a variety of ways. Uh, it quickly identifies solutions for small and medium manufacturing businesses, which we'll hear more about later. Um, and for the purposes of, purposes of this panel, I'm just gonna introduce you by your first name, refer to you as your first name, if that's okay. So switching over to the questions. So, Aaron, uh, can you tell us about the Manufacturing Extension Partnership with the state of Ohio? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm a Dayton guy, so it's great to be here. And uh, we already did the Go Raiders. So, um, <laughs> again, my name is Aaron Patrick. I am the interim state director of the Ohio Manufacturing Extension Partnership Program. That's really long on a business card when you consider that I work for the Ohio Department of Development. Um, it's, it's a very long uh, uh, intro. So 
what, what are we? We are funded through the National Institute of Standards and Technologies at a federal level, and then also through my office at the Ohio Department of Development, formerly known as the Department uh, Ohio Development Services Agency. So we just changed that. We're state government. We like to keep you on your toes, right? So what is the uh, Ohio MEP? Um, we are a group of manufacturing experts that help uh, small to medium-sized manufacturers solve problems. When we say small to medium-sized manufacturers, we're generally working with companies that are under 500 employees, okay? Um, it, it's any number of things. I'll talk about some of the services that we offer, uh, but really uh, quality-related issues, uh, equipment issues, and at the forefront of everyone's mind right now is workforce-related issues. So we are constantly talking to small and medium-sized manufacturers about workforce challenges that they currently have. Um, as I mentioned, uh, our, our objective is to work with smaller uh, manufacturers um, and create value. So um, we do this uh, by funding, so through my office, we are basically a grant administrator, and then we fund six regional partners. Um, Mr. Ratterman to my left is one of those regions, but we have six regions that we are funding so that we have people in the field actually working with manufacturers. So that was the key thing for us. We made a change um, 10 to 12 years ago to where we extended from two partners to six because we felt like we weren't reaching uh, enough clients. So this six region approach has really helped us in that area. This gives you an idea of our map, and if, and if you've heard of Jobs Ohio, we're structured similarly to them. Uh, again, we have people in the field that are actually working with clients. So in the Northeast region, we have an outfit called Magnet. Um, in the green area, uh, the Appalachian region, the Ohio State University, uh, South Centers, I.O., and we're not going to talk about Saturday. I was in the stadium. We're moving on. With that. In the Cincinnati region, we have uh, TechSolve, uh, our regional partner there. Uh, Mr. Ratterman to my left is uh, at the University of Dayton Research uh, Institute, and his organization is called Fastlane. Central Ohio is Columbus State University. And then in the Northwest uh, region, uh, the Center for Innovative Food Technology. And one thing about our, our network of experts, we're very diverse. We're in food manufacturing, machining, cybersecurity, advanced manufacturing principles, lean, Six Sigma. We do a lot of different things. This gives you an idea of the services that we provide. Now, we are funded through the federal government and state government. Our, our services are fee-based, so we want companies to have skin in the game uh, when they are looking to improve, remain relevant and competitive. Uh, this gives you an idea, so it's, uh, it's a pretty large gamut of things that we can do. Um, but for the purposes of today, cybersecurity is a huge thing that we're working on. Advanced manufacturing, advanced manufacturing to solve workforce challenges. Uh, we're combining those two items. Um, but this just gives you an idea of uh, the, the list of things that we can help small and medium-sized manu manufacturers with. Uh, some, some quick stats on the value that we provide. And this value comes directly from clients that we have worked with. There is a third-party survey that goes to clients at the completion of projects. This is all reported out from the clients. So this is value that we're creating jobs, uh, additional sales, investment, cost savings. Um, we have a net promoter rating of currently 91%, which is absolutely world class. Um, so we're doing a lot of great things, uh, and our ROI right now is, is we feel pretty, pretty solid. I'm gonna talk about an additional grant outside of our base uh, MEP funding that we're currently working on. This is through the Department of Defense. Ohio was designated as one of six uh, defense uh, manufacturing communities. It's a designation that we take extremely seriously and it is uh, a great thing for us to uh, promote our program and to work with um, the supply chain for, for DOD. So 
This, uh, this grant really, uh, we, we require that a company has a minimum 5% uh, sales with, uh, with the Department of Defense. And then we are working with them to create value in the area of technology advancement. So we want to help you advance your technology. We want to help you be as competitive and relevant uh, in the DOD space as possible. So we're very excited. We're about a year into this. Uh, this thing is about to take off, and we're going to do a lot of great things, I feel, with this grant. This just gives you a, a little more uh, information on the grant. Um, engagement, assessments, we're assessing people to figure out where they're at in terms of their technology levels. Um, so again, very excited by this, and you can contact any of our regional partners. We are all included in this grant. So. And I've mentioned uh, workforce challenges. Uh, again, it's, it's something that uh, is probably always going to be an issue, but coming off a pandemic and the current climate that we're in as of today, we're doing a number of things to try and combat this. One is a high school internship. We're trying to get young uh, people interested and, and involved in manufacturing. We really want to get someone uh, and really mold them into the future uh, employees in the manufacturing sector. We've placed uh, 300 students in the last couple years. Uh, we've worked with 113 manufacturers. So we're really trying to extend our reach uh, with high school students. Additionally, non-traditional workers, we're trying to engage them. There are a lot of great careers in manufacturing. So we're trying to engage people that we haven't uh, worked with in the past. Certifications and credentialing, we are trying to get people um, more technology savvy. That's what the entire world is going to. Um, so we're really trying to get people trained, uh, certified in robot, robotics, um, any number of areas so that we can continue to advance technologies for all Ohio manufacturers. So with that, yeah. we'll pass that down. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Ned. Can you tell us about the Ohio Manufacturing Institute and the interaction of Industry 4.0, excuse me, 4.0 and workforce? Well, thank you, I sure will. Um, the Ohio Manufacturing Institute is housed in the College of Engineering at uh, The Ohio State University. I've been told I have to say The Ohio State University the first time, and then I could go to normal people speak after it. <laughs> I do not show up with a, house, with a hat saying the on the front of it. Uh, but that's, that's a different issue I have with marketing. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so the Manufacturing Institute itself, we, we've been around since 2008. I joined the Institute in uh, 2015. I was the Dean uh, of the College of Urban Affairs at uh, Cleveland State University, and I wanted to get closer to do more economic development work, and I was mo most of my work was done with manufacturing up there. So uh, what we do is um, we work very closely with, um, with the Ohio MEP. I'm the former chair of the National Advisory Board for the program. I'm on the board uh, for Magnet. Uh, but more importantly, um, what, we're, what, what the Institute itself does is we are trying to work with Ohio. Well, we do work with Ohio's manufacturers to gain competitive advantage. Ohio is a manufacturing state, it's a proud manufacturing state, and we're in the middle of a transition that's gonna be like the transition that we went through through ERPs. We're at year three of a 20 year journey. So we're, we're here basically, I hate to say it, we're from the university, we think we're here to help, and it isn't about overhead. Um, and the other thing that we're doing is we've, we have responded and listened very closely to Ohio's manufacturers and really started to change a major part of our engineering programs by, in, by instituting a Bachelor of Science in Engineering Technologies. That is not on the main campus, it's in the regional campuses, and it is an experiential-based engineering program not to train a narrow research engineer, but get back to what the old manufacturing industrial engineer did, uh, which is, is dealing with, with, um, with that particular labor shortage, which we see. Um, the, the, the formula that we play around with is a really straightforward formula. You start with the, the digital enterprise, uh, add fifth generation operations technologies. Why don't we say industry 4.0? Well, first we looked at the work and we found out the Germans couldn't count and they missed one. 
which gives me great, great satisfaction. Uh, but the other thing is, we're focusing on operations technologies on the shop floor and strategic planning around those operations. And, when you, and, and then you deal with the workforce challenges, the focus that we have to the, to the future of Ohio's manufacturing competitiveness is increasing profits through productivity. And a large part of what we've been seeing about Industry 4.0 and the pull of 4.0 into plants is that it wasn't until this year that we began to see those adoptions dealing with labor workforce shortages on the shop floor itself. And we're also very concerned about the integrated digital enterprise. And we'll talk about that later. So digital transformation for manufacturers, particularly the small, uh, the very small ones, 500 and below, but really those from the sweet spot is those from 25 to about 250, is, is AIM. We need to accommodate old tools. We've run into too many consultants who have said, get rid of all your capital tooling and start again. Well, just give me a gun and get it over with. Um, we, we need to work with system integrators who can integrate the new tools. And we're dealing with the shop floor, which may have up to eight different versions of PLCs, and getting them to talk to each other, you might as well use Urdu as the common language. And that brings forward the cybersecurity issues. We need to migrate the integrated production process to a digital OT environment. So as we think about the digital enterprise, then the reason why I stopped talking about Industry 4.0 is if Industry 4.0 means everything, it means absolutely nothing. So what you've got is you've got the ERP managing the front end of, of, of the company and integrating to your MESs and other, other uh, and supply chain. That's not going to go away. In fact, they're going to tell you that they are the ultimate Industry 4.0 integrator and they're lying. Then the other thing that you've got is you've got B2B and B2C sales. That's top line oriented. That's everything that the Internet of Things promised. And we are saying that's right. That becomes a separate approach that has to be integrated. And then finally, the part which is important for Ohio is making certain that we can transition to a digitally integrated operations technology on the shop floor. What we found when we do this is that those companies that try to, to, to do all, think of all of Industry 4.0, they become vapor locked because it's too damn much. They aren't building it as thinking about it as a 20 year journey. Our consultants are making it worse because they look at everything as an automation project and they don't know what 20 years of automation projects are going to end up with. So what we're here working with the C-suite to say, you need strategic help. I'm not going to teach you about the engineering. I'm not going to teach you about the digital equipment. I can't do what MXD does. They do it incredibly well because I can't keep up with the evolutions of engineering. I don't understand. I'm, I'm just a poor, simple-minded economist, <laughs> which means I have little knowledge and much arrogance. All right. <laughs> now, quickly, four workforce, four, the four workforce challenges we're all dealing with, there's the semi-skilled labor challenge, completely different from the, from the, from the missing skilled machinists. We think of that as the, sumer, su, the silver tsunami, or gray weasels, one or the other, as people are moving, are retiring, um, and companies, rather than investing in new skilled workers, are spending most of their time to poach each other's, and that there's no solution in that. Um, we, there is uh, industrial maintenance technicians and applied manufacturing engineers, community colleges are stepping up, the Ramtech program is stepping up, uh, and most importantly, the regional sector-led workforce boards are stepping up. There's a place for that. The part that is the, it's not immediate, but it is absolutely important, is how are you grooming the manufacturing leaders to run your companies 10 to 20 years from now, 10 to 15 years from now. Now, when we ask that of companies to say, I want to be, be solvent five years from now, we, we got that. Uh, but what we're finding is that the senior leadership is, is missing. So that's the reason why Ohio State has stepped forward to, ste to establish the Bachelor of Science in Engineering Technology. What's our greatest barrier? There are no instructors or faculty for this stuff. So we have to work closely with industry to figure out how to get your folks into the classroom to, to, to build the pool. Um, I'm not going to go through this. This is basically a, a slide that does some work that shows the semi-skilled problem is going to take care of itself because that's where automation is going to take place. And our number of semi-skilled machine tenders is going to shrink, but it's not going to shrink for the next five years. So we've got an immediate problem. And the single most important skill that you have in your companies is that, that industrial maintenance technician 
first time I heard that name, I thought that was the guy who cleaned the bathrooms. Well, no, that's the person that keeps the operations technology going. Uh, and, and so that is probably the single key for competitive advantage. Um, this is just something that, that we got from um, the third, third way, third way uh, policy group, and they worked the data quite clearly that if you think about, if you look at bachelor's degrees, engineering technology right now is the third highest paid occupation in the United States. And we can't get kids into it, and our engineering schools are steering them towards research engineering, and it's really engineering technology is, is, is highly paid. Uh, the associate's degree, the electrical engineering technologies and um, uh, technicians, uh, those are the ones who are making cyber work with companies. Huge opportunity sitting there. And among the certificates, what are we seeing uh, right there is heavy industrial equipment maintenance technologies are, are getting good wages. So that we're working with our partners to make that work, and particularly the um, sector-based workforce partnerships across the state. As we did our research, what we found out is no one company has enough demand or flow of workers to do this on their own. We have to do it regionally. Phil? Thank you, Ned. You're welcome. So Phil, so UD has Fastlane. Uh, can you provide an overview of it um, and also what it is, some challenges and some successes? Glad to. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, oh, you could skip that slide. I was going to. I was going to try to wing it, Ned. What? Well, no, no, that was mine. <laughs> I didn't go to the Ohio State. I had a daughter went there, um, but I went to University of Dayton, and the University of Dayton actually has uh, two parts of their School of Engineering, which is really. I'm glad to hear Ohio State has this School of Engineering Technology coming on. UD had it since I was there, which is like a hundred years ago, back in the <laughs> 80, mm -hmm. early 80s. But they still turn out um, engineers and engineering technology graduates, and it's a pretty strong program. So I know, I know other people have added that too. So it's good to hear that Ohio State's adding that. I'm glad, glad to know that. Yeah, we're, we're rapid followers, I guess. No, I would not <laughs> rapid. I wouldn't. Yeah, <laughs> want that. So really quickly, we've been here for nine years. Uh, Fast Lane, as Aaron talked about, we're, we're one of the six partners around the state of Ohio. Those of you here attending in person, obviously, are, most of you are probably from Dayton. You know we're a manufacturing city, clearly. Um, we've been here, and I'm part of UDRI. Um, there's north of 750 people work there doing some phenomenal work for many of it, uh, the contracts are, are DOD related and Air Force related, obviously, everybody knows that. Um, my 12 people were a bunch of manufacturing consultants, and we do the work that Aaron spoke about earlier, and, and these are our, this is who we serve. Um, don't make, there's no test on there, so I'm just, there are people that are always saying, what, 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 who are you working on? And 90% and of what we do is the first line, and it's small and medium. We've done work with Honda, we've done work with GE, but that's not what we do for the most part. We do, most of our work is heavily associated with small and medium manufacturers who are all just trying to figure this out, what, what, what Ned certainly talked about, because they can't hire people. It was bad two years ago. It was terrible. Their workforce, everybody we talked about the last seven or eight years, it's always workforce. We can't find anybody to come in. Well, you, it's double or triply bad now. Um, I heard an co economist, not this one, <laughs> but I heard an economist in Phoenix two weeks ago, we were at the Center of Best Practices Conference, and this guy gave a, a really good, and he had dry humor like Ned's. Are you gonna stop with the 5.0? That didn't go over very well. I, I know. You got, I mean, I'm glad no one laughed at that. He's been talking about the Germans can't count. I've heard that line <laughs> seven or eight times. Maybe you guys have heard it, it before, too. It worked a year ago, but you know, my, my timing's off with COVID. Oh, okay, is that what it is? <laughs> So, so this person talked about, I think an amazing challenge that's coming is, the, we all know the baby boomers are heading out. I'm at the very tail end of that personally, but like my older brothers and sisters, they, they're all trying to figure out when, and, and what he said, the rate of the change of the number of retirees is way higher than it was yeah. a year and a half ago. Yeah. I mean, people are just saying, enough's enough. Forget the mass, forget the, they, so whether it's working from home, I don't know all the pieces of that, I, I'm not a, psychologist at all but I know all I know is I saw the numbers and it was it was earth-shattering so so it's it's the problem was bad two years ago and it's way worse now actually the problem is the stock market did too well and they said I'm getting out of here <laughs> if we had crashed the stock market we would have gotten rid of that end of the yeah, workforce true. problem true. <laughs> some people might say we're working on that um, so small medium 90 percent of what we do and um, Aaron says and he talked about the ODMC grant that we had that we're taking part in we've already done one project we're going to do a number more over the next two, two and a half years that that program still runs. Yep. I just, uh, at times, 
we are, we are reasonably priced consultants is a good way to think about us, but we also have grants and we stretch our clients' dollars further, okay? That's the way to good thing. Sometimes we have grants for cyber help. Sometimes we have grants for additive manufacturing. We've had those in the past. Quality systems, whether it's ISO or AS9100 for aerospace companies. We do, we do a lot of things with those grants where we make the company put skin in the game first, and when they tell us what it means to them and their, client and their company, how much growth they might experience by doing this project, excuse me, then, then we actually use our grant and we'll offset some of their costs and make their dollars go further. Let's get $20,000 of the work done over the next three months and you pay 15 and I'll pay five, right? I'll charge, I'll charge the state of Ohio grant that I might have that's related to this specific technology area. So we, sometimes we have those, sometimes we don't and our, and our clients are understand that. So, but it's always, you're paying first, it's meaningful to you. We never go out there with people with their handouts, why don't you pay for this? We don't, it's, there's never, this is not a social program by any means. It's always about making sure the manufacturers are going forward. I'm not gonna touch any of this stuff. We just did our website here a few, a few months back. But, and we copied some of the, the, the figures uh, from our friends in uh, Missouri, the Show Me State. Anyway, our, 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 our icons are different and our titles are different, but these are our five main buckets that Fastlane has work in. We've done work in all those areas and in each of the five sub-bullets within each one. And I wanted to make sure that people here might have saw the fact that we do things certainly in cyber. We have three companies, might be four now, we have four vetted companies in town that do only that. I have people, within UD and UDRI that know this world a little bit, but we have companies that do it every single day. So we don't try to tread on for-profit businesses that are already operating in the Dayton region. We vetted them, we use them all the time for our clients. Um, and the other ones are the, are the things on the left-hand side where we're talking about, there's some large divisions within UDRI that do sensor work. And, and a lot of the things they're doing are helping co companies that do things like machine learning. And we've done many projects in those areas. So we have, of individuals who can be leveraged and, and, and do those things for our clients. Mostly about product development and new, new companies that are creating products. Um, just a quick thing about our solution providers. We do the work, like you saw the previous slide, there, there was um, all the lean stuff. I have people on my staff that do 5S and, and we, we take people's manufacturing shop floors and we do all the lean things that you've heard about for years. Well, some people, it's amazing, if you scored companies from zero to 100, you know, some are all the way up here at 100 and some are down here at zero. We find these companies all over the board. Right. And it's amazing how, how, how different, because the shop people, they're there with their head down. They're making stuff, they're shipping their product, they're sending the invoice and hoping to get paid. And they're also hoping that and today, as you've heard many times, the material, they're hoping the material, the steel or the aluminum, whatever they're waiting to show up, actually shows up so they can do what they do in the supply chain. So. They don't network very well. The manufacturers, our clients, are horrible at networking. So what we do is we help these people understand what's out there um, from the state support from the MEP that we do and, and just try to enable them to help change their culture, change their... So, so that's what we have. We have Fastlane employees that do directly work with our folks on the shop floor. We have UDRI partners. I mentioned people doing cyber, people doing additive manufacturing. There's 750 people. We bring this technology expert, subject matter experts, out to clients when we find a specific technology that needs to be done. And then, like I mentioned, the cyber, we have many other areas, marketing services. We have a lot of companies around town that we quickly connect to. And our ability to take businesses who are doing work and, and get them in front of clients that need that work has been very successful for us in the last nine years. Um, that's it. All right, Thank, thanks, Phil. Uh, so this next question will flow through each panel member, but we're gonna start with Ned. Um, so can you tell us about what the digital maturity assessment is? Sure. You want Thank to you. Back? So together, uh, we are piloting the digital transformation assessment. As I mentioned, one of the largest problems that we've been, rec we've been seeing over the three years we've been going in, in and out of plants, companies, it's actually not on the shop floor, it's up in the C-suite. What do I do first? How do I approach this? What's my roadmap? And more importantly, um, how do I make certain that I have a business case for making the investments in cyber and digital that I know I need to do? Um, and uh, the, it, we, we have taken the research around this to, to some industry week, 100 companies, and we've driven it up and down the train. Now, the, the groups doing it, there's, a, there's a, an outfit called the MPI Group, 
Um, if, if any of you read Industry Week or follow Industry Week's best plants competition, that's all the work of the MPI group. Um, they also have, also have, have, have piloted uh, digital maturity assessments in supply chain work, and the Gates Foundation hired them to take that work, adapt it to Africa, put it in French and in English, and start trying to help improve the medical supply chains in Africa. So they're, they're really good. Uh, but more importantly, they're from Ohio. They know our types of manufacturing. Um, Ohio Manufacturing Institute and MPI work very closely together, and the good thing is that um, the national MEP um, awarded Ohio a grant to pilot this, and we're working with Phil's operation and the others. So the important thing is, what is this thing? So, and why does it work? It's to try to get you to move towards digital maturity and move away from standalone automation projects. Um, digital, digital transformation starts with a maturity model and it tracks the maturity of the company. We break down the eight parts of your business and figure out where you are across each of those eight parts. Um, and more importantly, it just doesn't do the assessment. We do that with your team. Your team owns the assessment, not us. And we, we leave the team so that you start building a business roadmap to figure out your path to digital maturity. You come back, you can work with us. We, rec we recommend companies come back three or four times a year to keep that team on pra on, 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 in, in going. Uh, but more importantly, this has to be actionable. This is, you know, I, we've had companies say, oh, my CFO will, will fill this out. My chief manufacturing officer is going to be filled out. No, this has to be done with the team, be facilitated, so that as a team, you could do the Gemba walk when you're done. That's hugely important. So the, the, what are the eight categories, the digital manufacturing, um, uh, the digital tra uh, uh, transformation um, assessment works with? First, we look at leadership, strategy, deployment, technologies for di digitization, the business end, and say, how well are you digitized and digitally integrated in, in the front end of the company itself? We do the same thing in production, so that's the operations technologies, and there we find great amount of variance across the companies we talk to. Warehouse and distribution, where are you in terms of best practices to drive digitization with warehouse and warehouse, and where are the KPIs, and how does that link into the supply chain? That's next. Uh, logistics and transportation, um, we, do the, we go through the same ex exercise. Then best practices support digitization with customers and customer-centric. Um, KPIs. That is the B2B end of the, wor of, of the work. Uh, we even look and see how well uh, digitally integrated your support functions are and are you producing smart products with, with value. We don't answer that question. We facilitate it. You as a corporate team answer each of those eight sets of questions. Then the data goes into a database that we maintain. Um, it, is, it is secure so that no one gets your, your, your company-specific work, and uh, then you benchmark yourself against peers. But more importantly, over time, you benchmark yourself against yourself because that's the one that's most important. We're also encouraging companies to, to do a visual representation of this through photographs, but companies are so nervous about images of their proprietary technology. You keep those, we don't keep those, but we found out that as you discuss and look at those visual changes, you suddenly uh, get shared knowledge as to what's taking place. So how then does this work? Well, it's a five-point scale. Zero, A, we ain't doing it yet. One, we're aware, we think we know. You don't know the number of companies that don't know lean and don't know digital operations technology at all. And they're completely lost, so, so this is the compass stage. Um, at level two, early applications. That's where we're seeing 3D printing. We're seeing some customized robotics taking place, but they tend to be standalone cells. Three, monitoring. Um, essentially, we think we know we're underway. We're starting to do a couple projects. And then the big question to us, are you thinking about how those projects relate to each other and across the corporation? What's the digital thread? Uh, four, managing it. That, now, if you're four, you're way ahead of the pack. That is where essentially everything outside of semiconductors is right now. Um, we used to think pharmaceuticals were there, but 
than some contract makers of COVID made me think maybe not. Uh, COVID vaccines said maybe not. And five, leveraging its widespread. And there are just basically the industry week or manufacturers in the Fortune 50 are at that stage. Not, not, not all of them either. What? Not all of them either. Just oh, no, them. no. Uh, my favorite one is, is it, we've gone into a number of plants where they'll have their digitally integrated line and their legacy line. And, 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 and we aren't saying scrap the legacy line. How do you integrate it? Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and so ideally what happens is this gets facilitated by an engineer from one of the MEP programs that is going to say, I don't have the, the, all the digital answers, but our networks will help you get that answer. And we and you build the business case. So we're here really more as facilitators than, than sales, sales consultants. And, and real quick, in Ohio, we can count to five. So that's very important. We just displayed that. We've got that stuff here. Yeah. So the team records constraints and notes about the category. That's the reason why I can't be the CFO, the chief manufacturing officer, because we have to help facilitate conversation across that leadership team and make certain that they have, and, and what's good is they can be brutally honest, which is great. So do you have human resources, talent, improvement process knowledge, access to enabling technologies, leadership, guidance, funding. Actually, the best leadership question I got, one of this, was this happened two plants. Because of COVID, the CEO was not physically in the plant, was working from home, their productivity went up. <laughs> well, they found out the CEO was just an incredible, I think the technical term was Budinsky. <laughs> Uh, and, and that led to a huge tech, uh, uh, transformational change in the company. That increased things tremendously. Um, what's the infrastructure like? Uh, and then what are, what, is there enough external support? Again, big barrier we found for all companies is the system integrators have so much work, they aren't looking at anything than a high six-figure contract to even get started. Uh, and that's where specialized companies uh, working with the MEP may be able to help. And we do this, that you, not we, you do this for all eight parts of your business. So that when we get done, you're, the, the, the dashboard is going to show where's your overall score. And then it's also going to show where you are in product, ca in different categories. And we know that you aren't going to do everything. If, if you go up to the Trump plant in Naperville, Illinois, which is a great plant to visit, it's a demonstration factory of a completely digitally integrated stamping company. And they sell machines, so you can come in and look. It's great. But they essentially want to do a greenfield plant. You aren't going to do that when you have a billion dollars worth of, of legacy capital sitting there with limited, limited constraints. So what you have to do is figure out how to do this as a roadmap. You have to own that roadmap. So the, D, the, the digital transformation team uh, you know, turns these insights into action. And it isn't your consultant or the facilitator that's going to do it. It's your team that's going to do it. And together, the facilitator, the MVP, can actually help you project by project or may actually say, no, there's this different company that's better, but you need the roadmap. Think ERP 20 years ago. Whenever I do that to people, people, they start breaking out into, into sweat. So, so the part four is that is the spreadsheet of initial projects that gets revisited. You try to figure out what the scale economies are, what's the, what's the uh, rate of return. We found, by the way, there are two versions of a rate of return that's important. There's the financial rate of return, but there's also the critical pain in the ass, which is something that takes so much man management time, and it's so important to, to the, 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 the operation, maybe hiring, that it's difficult to translate into dollars. Uh, we work hard to get you to do that, but you deal both of them. And then use the improvements that, you know, to, to make certain that your entire team is invested. That's where the Gemba Walk comes in. So you're looking at these projects with people on the shop floor. Now, what have we just done? We essentially worked and got you to next lean. Now, if a company has no experience at lean at all, we're going to be pretty clear that the first thing you got to do and the cheapest thing to do with the highest return is lean. lean. <laughs> And what we find out is, is that when companies are in an absolute crisis, they're trying to save the company, they're too busy to do lean. 
whether they're doing well and coming out of the crisis, they're working so hard to get product to the customer, they're too busy to do lean. Well, what happens is you usually find out that either upper level management, middle level management doesn't want to give up control. And it's a culture issue, all right? So the, so the, the improvement plan will guide your transformation. That's what it's about. We don't want you to be in a position where your largest customer says, complete traceability, complete digital records, complete digital integration with my systems, and you're trailing them. Because this has to be a way to ensure the company for the long run. If you're running your company quarter to quarter, and you're, you're trying to figure out how to cash out to move to Florida, realize one, hurricanes, fire ants, and cockroaches the size of, 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 of semi-tractor tra trailers. But this is a long-term bet. This is a visual statement to your team and to yourself that, that this is a strategy that's going to get us from one year to five years. And it's going to be the strategy then that will bridge us from five years to 20 years. No one in this room knows how to do business beyond five years, but we have to set the roadway, the pathway. Um, so walking the walk, start the digital journey with the digital transformation ass assessment, and you begin action with that Gemba walk through the plant. But it's more than just the operations technology. It's going through the warehouse. It's going, going through your, ca your, your, your research and design and, and customized design services. It's going to the front end of the house and figure out where you're going to get the highest return. And, and that is a walk that we would love to be able to do with your company. So we move teams from analysis to improvement. This is the steps we take you through. It's actually a four-hour session with some pre-work uh, with follow-up. Uh, these are the six steps, but because of time, well, you, can, you can get the slides and see it. And at that point, I say thank you very much. Great. Right. Thanks, Ned. So any more comments from any of the other panel members on this uh, particular topic? I'll just say on the digital transformation, that does flow through our office. Um, and so our six regions are uh, engaged in this along with uh, Ned's, Ned's group. So, um, yeah, we, we, uh, we're really excited about this opportunity for Ohio manufacturers. There are two uh, grants that we talked about here, the one Ned just spoke about for the last 10 minutes, and, and that's for any manufacturing company, not necessarily in the DOD supply chain, whereas the one we talked about earlier is the Ohio Defense Manufacturing Community, if there's defense manufacturing supply chain companies. Um, as long as 5% of your revenue comes in the DOD, then you're, you qualify for that, and they're both aimed at the same thing, uh, related. It's, it's taking your current operations and doing more in the digital and new advanced manufacturing capabilities and us finding ways to help companies adopt those technologies. We're not inventing anything brand new, it's just getting them up that, up, up that uh, trail of, it's, just, it's like I said for lean. But the, but the one thing you want to do in either way, if, if you're trying to do a, a digital transformation or you're just trying to adopt some new technologies, you don't want to come in and put automation on a sloppy process, it just doesn't work. Actually, what you end up is doing is you automate a crappy process. Yeah, so, so never, I mean, we, we tell people just don't do it. We, we, where I came from in my corporate life before I do the job I do now, it was uh, thou shalt not do such a thing. So that's ingrained in my mind, that's ingrained in our team's mind, and I think you just, because then you end up spending a bunch of money, you automate it, and, and still, you don't get near the, the payback of the ROI, and your production processes are not what they ought to be. Right. So. So there has to be some degree of lean in the culture that allows you to simplify things first, and then you take the simplified process, whether you're building something or whether it's an office process that has to do with building your customers or, yep. or, or, or receiving uh, goods from and your purchasing and procurement folks. So well, all that, those I, things need to be done appropriately and, and leaned out. And then, then software can come in and start doing all kinds of automation, and then your, your ROIs jump up in orders of magnitude. So I would say that that's something. Well, that, and thanks, Phil, you've seen this time after time. How many companies have paid for their capital investment from the savings from lean? In many times. All right, thank, well, thank you both. Um, I'm gonna move over to some questions from the audience real quick with the last sure. couple minutes we have. So, uh, question number one, for those of us with high school kids, how do we expose them to engineering technology career fields? 
I mean, I'll, I'll start. I mean, uh, initially, can, can there. Can you repeat the question again? I, yeah. I For just had trouble my hearing aid shorted out. <laughs> For those of us with high school kids, how do we expose them to engineering technology career fields? Okay. So, uh, Dr. Hill mentioned RAM Tech as, a, as an opportunity. There are career technical uh, centers throughout the state of Ohio. RAM Tech is, uh, I won't know the entire, uh, robotics, automation, uh, a bunch of really great stuff and cool stuff that your, your high school students, I mean, it's the old vocational schools that you cannot call them vocational schools now. They are career techs and they're very high tech. I would look at enrolling them into one of those programs. I would look at whatever region of the state that you're in, contacting your regional MEP and get into an in internship program right. so that we can connect you with companies so you can start to learn uh, those types of things. We want to, we want to employ your uh, sons and daughters. And, and it's really important to those kids that learn by doing. And what we find is the kids that, that learn by connecting their heads to their hands, this is, this is just a, a great way of getting a education that's completely competitive with the traditional academic track. I would suggest one more thing that um, wherever you are in the state, there's STEM opportunities and not formal STEM school, but these robotics and there's, all, there's just tons of where they go and the kids get together with other 16 year olds or 15 year olds and, and they build Competition. Yes, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's really hands-on, so that drives a lot of uh, younger folks into understanding how cool making stuff is. We, just, we still make a lot of things in this country. It's, it's, everything didn't go to China. There's still tons of things made in this country. All right, thank you, thank you. I'm gonna jump to another one here. Do these programs that you all have talked about today have any links into the, Depart excuse me, the Defense Department and or the Air Force? But, uh, was the question how do these programs link to the Defense Department? Okay. Um, with the work that I do with uh, NIST directly, uh, what we're finding is the Defense DOD is becoming a huge supporter of these types of activities because DOD is absolutely petrified about the state of the supply chain. Um, particularly when it comes to, to with metalworking companies, uh, but there are also um, uh, the new sets of, of technology, start 3D printing, all that basic technology was DOD investment. Um, so DOD, uh, when it comes to some of the American makes partners we work with, that was DOD funding. Um, and uh, what I'm hearing over the past year is DOD is becoming much more aggressive working with the National Institute of Standards and Technologies at the cyber um, machining interface. Uh, so I, I, I believe uh, they're very strong supporters of what we do. In fact, I, I did a, a panel about two weeks ago with someone from, um, from, the, from, Na from the Department of the Navy, um, and she was essentially selling supply chain on MEP services uh, as being important to keep her supply chain up and going. Your, your regional MEP can connect you with tech scouts uh, in all facets of the military. So we are a connection point to tech scouting, to advanced technologies in the military. So we can help companies in that area. All right, thank you. We have two minutes. Maybe we can squeeze one more in. All right, so another question here for the panel. What are the tra excuse me, traditional, transitional strategies for small to medium industries given their economic constraints and low risk tolerance? I think um, it was stated recently in a board meeting I had with my board folks talking about their, their current state of affairs. It was funny, I, I made a joke later the night, uh, every week it's something else. Their supply chain, they're, 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 all, they're waiting on these things to come in. And then one of my board members said, 3M. I was talking about a different client we had who was the biggest user of 3M double-sided sticky tape because they make gaskets for windshields and whatnot. In the country, biggest 3M user. He said, 3M, they're costing me a fortune right now because they use several tubes to, to, to do an adjoining of, of some of their aluminum rails. And he can't get the tubes of this thing. So 
there's an issue here, the supply chain that goes on and every week it's something new. And, and all the people stacked up across my board were talking the same thing. Yeah. So the supply chain is, is, we're trying to figure out ways we can help with this, but that's really almost, it, it's just gonna have to figure itself out because the, you got, everybody knows what integrated circuit you know, chips and whatnot for the cars. And I'm, I would like to buy a new truck, but I'm not gonna go buy one. There's two sitting there. I want, I want 200 to pick from. I'm not, I'm kind of choosy when I would buy my next vehicle, right? So that supply chain thing is what, what's concerning about it is the fact that when he goes to buy his next box, there's like $200 for this box of say 100 tubes of this 3M stuff. You think he's gonna buy one? No. He's got several tens of thousands of dollars of stuff he didn't ship here in September. So when 3M finally delivers in that box, it's worth having $600 of stuff in because of his ROI. So what's, it's going to continue to be a very difficult thing because the people, he doesn't need three boxes, but he's going to buy three boxes because he doesn't want to run out of that stuff again. It's worth having that inventory on his shelf to not shut down production. So, and, it, and next week it'll be something else. So the supply chain and, and things that are coming in are going to be very difficult to, and, and we're just going to have to um, find ways to, to help people figure this out. And I think it's going to drive more supply, more local. So, so, so five, five seconds maybe for each okay, of you to quick one. wrap up. The key to a transition strategy for a company that hasn't started. I think that was the question. I may yeah, have tra Transition okay. strategies, yeah. All right, the single most important thing to do is plan. And then the second most important thing to do is act. It's like the same way we started with lean. I don't care what lean methodology you use, get one of them and just stick with it and move with it. So uh, again, uh, we, put together at, and we're testing the, uh, the digital transformation assessment to get rid of that vapor lock, to get you moving, and understanding that you need a roadmap, you need a compass, and that has to come from you, and it's gotta be owned by your team, and let's get moving, because otherwise, every week it is something else. Thanks, Ned. Aaron, Not that I have an opinion. Aaron, last, very, last very, very quickly, we're here to help. Contact us. Let us help you. We want you to be relevant. We want you to remain competitive. All right. Thank Last you. comment. The ODMC grant we talked about, it's not for the Lima tank plant. It's not for GE jet engines in Cincinnati, right, Avondale. It's for all the hundreds and hundreds of Ohio supply chain companies that make all those parts that go on those big devices. So that's what our entire goal is is, is what DOD is expecting us to do so that the suppliers in Ohio are better and more capable of creating their parts and shipping into the DOD supply chain. All right, great. Thank you all for your time. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.